I'd like to welcome everybody to the Robert G. McKinnon Council Chambers, Tuesday, June 12, 2012, 7 p.m. Um, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. At this time, we'll move on to agenda item number two, public input. Is there any public members that would like to address the school committee? Tom Quinney, 8 Crescent Street. Mr. Chairman, Thank you for this opportunity to address the Southbridge School Committee. Over the past several weeks, I have sat by and heard members of this committee refer to my wife as an underground terrorist, a member of some negative political group, someone waging a venomous attack, and at the time, I found such things laughable. That was until the last meeting when laughable crossed the line to offensive and bordering on slanderous. Let me begin by telling you a bit about Erin Quinney. She is a dedicated wife and invested, an invested, involved, committed mother to our three children. <clears throat> she is a thoughtful, intelligent woman of great integrity and independence with a mind of her own, a strong sense of right and wrong and what is just. She is not a part of any negative group. Her comments are on behalf of herself and no one else. Her only agenda was to do what was right. <clears throat> what motivated my wife to speak at the April 24th meeting was not anything political, as some of you have claimed. It was her personal integrity. She felt she could not sit by and allow such outrageous statements and behavior to take place before her and not speak out against it. <clears throat> she read the, the policy manual and found out how she needed to address her concerns and followed the, that policy exactly. She addressed the committee <coughs> during public input addressing her concerns to the chairman. She put her complaints in writing, addressing them to the appropriate person or group, stating in her complaint the action she would like taken. And she did so respectfully. At the following meeting, she asked when she could expect to hear a response to her complaints and was told that the school committee doesn't have jurisdiction over enforcing its own policies and that she should address her concerns with the voters. She did as she was instructed and brought her concerns to the voters through a letter to the editor that was published in the Southbridge Evening News, which she read at the town council meeting. Again, respectfully, stating what was said by Mr. Lazo and the corresponding violation she felt was committed. Not one of the facts or quotes has ever been disputed by Mr. Lazo or anyone on the committee. Now that brings us to the last meeting when you had the school committee lawyer come to address her complaints and you would not let her answer and clarify anything for Ms. Rozak. While Ms. Rozak had the floor, you opened the floor to committee members to ask Ms. Rozak questions. That is where the line was crossed. When a member of this committee accused my, my wife of launching a character assassination against Mr. Lazo, my wife never called into question his character or attempted to minimize his contributions to the community. She simply said what he did and said, uh, said on April 10th was wrong and he should be held accountable for it. The only character assassination attempt that has been waged is by members of this committee against my wife because she had the audacity and courage to stand up for what she felt was right. Now, Mr. Chairman, on the comments directed specifically to my wife and assertion that she does very little to, in this community, this could not be farther from the truth. First of all, she was on the Re reconfiguration committee and put in hours volunteering her time and doing research then came and stood in front of this committee and offered positive and constructive information and feedback regarding the elementary school reconfiguration. Aaron has been an active member of the Southbridge PTA since our son entered kindergarten last year, again volunteering many hours of her time. 
She is on the Eastford Road School Council, where she yet again, where yet again she volunteers her time and has offered almost uh, <clears throat> and uh, has offered many solutions during the problem-solving process. She has sat in the audience at almost every school committee meeting this year so that she knows what is going on within the district. She works in this community pro providing children birth to three with developmental delays, physical therapy and group services, and their fa families with service coordination. This winter, she led a music and movement group at the Jacob Edwards Library. She volunteers her time at Mass General where she is the co-chair of the Family Advisory Committee, sits on the Bioethics Committee, trains residents in communication skills, and played an integral role on the committee that worked on getting a standalone pediatric endoscopy unit at the hospital. The respect my wife is due as a person, a parent, a citizen, and a voter greatly exceed any that this committee has shown her. For you to use your positions and your time in your capacity as school committee members to attack the character and integrity of a parent in this district and assert misinformation as if it was truth is beyond disappointing, shameful, and off offensive. It demonstrates an egregious misuse of power and a complete lack of integrity. If this is the behavior and level of discourse we can expect from members of our school committee, I think we are in a lot of trouble. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Quinney. Is there anybody else from the public that would like to address the school committee? Is there anybody else from the public? If not, agenda item number three, meeting call to order. Roll call, secretary. Mr. DiGiorgio. Present. Dr. DeMico. Excused. Mr. Jovian. Excused. Mr. Lazo. Present. Dr. O'Leary. Present. Mrs. Principe. Present. Mrs. Woodruff? Present. Five present, two excused. We have a quorum. Moving on to agenda item number five, consent items. A, warrant number 43 in the amount of $240,463.98. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? second. Mr. Wiggins? You comment to this? Consent agenda item. We've already signed this one. Okay. No comment from the business manager. All those in favor? Opposed? Unanimous of all present. Moving on, the approval of minutes. Regular meeting, school committee meeting, May 22nd, 2012. Do I hear a motion? Second. Do I hear a second? Second. It's a motion and a second. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions to those minutes of that meeting? If not, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstention? Motion passes. Minutes accepted. Moving on to agenda item number seven, reports. Rep representative of the Student Advisory Committee. She has since graduated, and we will not have a representative to, uh, till next year when they uh, elect a representative to the school committee. Moving on to presentations, agenda item number eight, A, Southbridge Curriculum Alignment Team for Mathematics. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the, the, our math team, uh, and uh, Mr. Zangi, our Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, I think is gonna set the, the technology up, but uh, we have teachers here tonight in three areas, mathematics, uh, English language arts and uh, special education and uh, we wanted to showcase what our staff is doing uh, to align to the Common Core in math and ELA but also in the new integrated service model for special education and I, I really am very proud of all these teachers I'm not going to announce each one of their names they can introduce themselves as they come up but uh, the administrative team and the teachers have been working very very hard very closely together uh, but we wanted to showcase our teachers tonight because they're the ones that are doing the the nuts and bolts front, front line work. So I'll introduce the math team and they can introduce themselves as they come up. <laughs> Safety in numbers. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Pam Abate and I'm a teacher at Southbridge High School. I currently teach grade nine and I'm on the Southbridge Curriculum Alignment Team. We have the nickname SCAT, um, and this is our math group. Um, I'd like to introduce everybody that's with me tonight. This is Emily Mantino. Emily is from Charlton Street School. I also have behind her Shanna Hare from the high school and Maria Murray. Maria Murray um, is from West Street. 
And I have Allison Rossi, I see, behind her from Charlton Street. I have Steve Bousquet, who is um, from the middle school, and he's also the math department um, chair at the middle school, high school. And I have Dana Jusaitis, hopefully I said her name right, from Eastford Road. And I have Margaret Sporty from Eastford Road with me tonight. So without further ado, I wanted to speak to you about our four goals um, that the SCAT team has. The first goal is to communicate with you. That is our goal as a team, is to share with the district what we're doing on the curriculum redesign. That's why we're here tonight, um, to tell you all the work we're doing to line up with the new Massachusetts standards. Our second goal is to work closely with the district administration and the teachers as we go through this process over the next multi-years that we're going to be transitioning. And it's, it's our job. We're going to be educating the educators on, this, on the new curriculum. And now we get into the nuts and bolts. This is where we roll our sleeves up and we get to work. Um, our third goal is creating a living, breathing document that will serve as a resource. We refer to it as the Schedule of Assessed, Assessed Standards, or SAS, and it will lay out all of the new common core. It will actually structure it throughout the year in four distinct groups, um, which I'll talk about more in a little bit. And then our fourth goal, the last bullet here, is we're going to create units of instruction. And this is something we've never done before. Um, this is what I love about this, what we're working on, is that we're going to have, through Atlas Rubicon software, one place where each teacher will have access to com complete resources and details of what they need to teach, approximations of when they need to teach it, and sharing sharing across grade levels and across um, content in the district. So it's going to be a great resource. Um, the more detailed, those were our four goals, so now I want to talk a little bit more about the schedule of assessed standards. They will be aligned to the new curriculum. That's something we have to do, right? We have to all line up with the new standards. We also need to realize that there's going to be not MCAS testing in the future, there's going to be new park assessment, and that will be online, and that will be coming down the road for everybody. So we need to be on board with that. Um, continuing what the SAS will do for us, it's going to be a roadmap for instruction. So remember I mentioned a few minutes ago about the four cycles? We'll have specific dates. Each teacher will be told on October 11th, you will be um, testing the park standards on these five standards. So each teacher will know that for those 26 days in the first period of the year, they need to teach to those specific standards and they'll have a guideline on how to do that. It's very clearly articulated. It sets a high level of rigor. I like how it's really raising the bar for what we need to teach our students. And it's just very clear what we need to do and what we need to do at each grade level. So I think this is going to be a great tool for our district to really you know, move forward into the future. And now, um, Emily will continue the presentation. Hello. Um, one of the things that this uh, stand of the SAS will do is it's going to um, tell us the standards, all the teachers, what standards need to be taught in a given cycle, and it's also going to provide them with a list of resources but it's not going to set the pacing guide, so it's not going to tell them on a day-to-day -day when you have to teach everything. It's, it's going to tell you um, in a given amount of time when to teach. Um, and it's not going to tell you how to teach. It's going to provide you with a list, an uh, extensive list of activities and resources that every teacher can use so that they can individualize their instruction. Um, they're going to be using Atlas Rubicon to create the units. And the first thing they do is they set up the time frame and the units that they will be teaching, what standards they will be addressing. And as they create them, they're going to be including essential questions, the standards, activities, the resources that they can use, the assessments that they can use. 
um, technology, links, um, documents that they can access. So all teachers can, there'll be a, a wealth of information that can be accessed. And um, we've already had one training to accomplish learning how to use the Rubicon. And we have another, one, another full day the day after school gets out on the 20th. And then we'll be using the summer to create more. And Maria Murray will continue. Thank you. All right, so we have a process that we've been following. And we started with setting up that uh, schedule of assessed standards. And now we are now working on aligning our current math textbook to the Common Core standards. As we were doing that work, we found that there were a lot of gaps in the math program that we are currently using. So we are filling in as many of those as we can onto the schedule. And then we're examining new support material, asking the teachers what we can use to fill in all of those gaps. And um, that work has already started. We are continuing creating the schedule. It's in a draft form now at this time and it should be finished pretty soon. We're working on units on the Atlas Rubicon. Some teachers are ahead of other teachers as far as starting because we haven't had our training yet, but there are some teachers that have already jumped in and there are units available for people to look at on the Atlas. So the team has already started creating them. We are also working on designing some formative assessments that will be used to decide um, using using the formative assessments to help us with our RTI, our response to intervention. So as you're teaching, you're assessing right along the way, right at the moment that you're teaching, you're assessing the kids and deciding which kids need to go back and do this again, which kids can move forward. Um, the interim assessments are being used as benchmarks, so we'll know at that point in time on October 11th which kids got it, which kids need to go back in and do it again. So we have two different kinds of assessment going on. This coming year, the team is planning on continuing the process of designing our units and sharing those with all the teachers across all the grade levels and across the content areas, and also communicating with our district leaders on any opportunities that come up to improve and any successes that are go ongoing. So we'll be modifying that schedule of assess standards as we go along and taking a look at it and continually modifying it. Any questions for our team? Any questions? Yeah, let, let me just follow up with what they said for a second. First of all, this is really difficult work. I, I think the, the team here has, has put in a, in a framework that admirably makes it easy to understand, but I don't think, I, I think it's important to understand how hard this team is working. This is not like copy it out of a book. This is where you really have to match standards that are written in a not so easy to read form to what we're actually, what we have and what we don't have and then find things to fill the gaps. So the work that these folks are doing is admirable. Uh, it will have an impact on teaching and learning for kids. And uh, I think, I, I tell you, I appreciate the work that you're doing and I know the other teachers will appreciate the work that you're doing when we roll this out to the rest of the staff. Uh, and I know that, that, uh, uh, that it's not easy, but, but, but we are very th thankful to have a quality staff to, to work on this. So I'll turn it over to the school committee. Any questions at this time? Everyone? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just going back to schedule of assessed standards, and you speak about PARC, P-A-R-C-C, -C, assessment online, and I, I believe this is the first time I'm hearing about this, and um, it replaces the existing MCAS. Could you the 46, expand on that? The 46 states that joined together um, that are using the Common Core standards, they are also designing new assessments to go with those new standards, and PARC is one of those assessments. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out, and this team may not know it, they may, it, the, the original design for the PARC rollout assessment mm -hmm. was 2014, and quite frankly, that process is substantially behind. So we don't anticipate this new assessment replacing the MCAS uh, in 2014. However, the MCAS is changing 
to kind of accommodate some of that lag time. So it's important that we match these standards up because they will be tested using MCAS initially and then roll over to the park assessment. Uh, and I see on your notes there that you ask what PRCC stands for, and I should know that, but I don't memorize all the acronyms we use, and, and I see math people go like this. I, some of us don't know what that means. Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. That's the partnership that the federal government forced us to, to, to do if we took race to the top money and accepted the Common Core Standards. And I do see that, that it replaces it at the end of the, you know, the multi-year transition. Thanks. That's it. Any other questions? Dr. O'Leary? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Lazo. And I appreciate all the time and hard work. And thank you, Eric, for pointing out the, the difficulty of uh, uh, getting to where we all have to get uh, in this district. I, I know the math team at the top of the high school, at the top end this year, did a really wonderful job uh, representing the district, and that's kudos to them all the way up and the teachers that helped them. I, I want to make sure that as we go from MCAS, which was the cat's meow or the, the big deal some years ago, and now, well, it wasn't really quite the big deal, and now we're going on to something else, and I guess that's the way things evolve, which we should all embrace, I, I suppose. Um, However, it, it seems easy, to, what I notice is it seems easy to get lost for all of us, to get lost in the transition from the last best thing to the next best thing. Um, I have to say that I, I am uh, hopeful that uh, this works um, admirably because we need it. I, I guess I hearken back, my concern is that I, I hearken back to a time not so long ago when although you'd have kids doing very, really well at one level in the district, um, by the time they got to another, another level in the district, there was difficulty, there were deficits, there was kids, there, were, there was a, a fallback, if you will, of, of progress and um, it, it appeared to me that you'd, you'd have to sort of make up some time as you went from uh, one school to another, uh, if you will, and I, I really want to make sure, guys, that we do not get lost in the grand scheme of MCAS and PARC and whatever the next thing is going to be. We need to make sure that we are uh, cohesive and, and efficient and effective and all the way up, right, from each of the elementary schools right up to the middle school, uh, progressing through the middle school, middle school without any bumps in the road on to the excellence that uh, many of our students, for instance, the math team has shown. Um, this last year, so please, I, I implore you all to keep that in mind as we don't don't get lost in the in the the, uh, the, the popularity of the next best thing. Please just make sure we're sticking to what our kids need in a straightforward line. That's what that's what uh, they need to to excel, and I, I hope we can uh, make sure that's in part of this whole structure. Thanks. I think that's the strength of this team, Doctor. Uh, I think I think. The, the fact that you have here elementary teachers who teach down into the second and third grade all the way up through high school teachers and one of the team members who's not here tonight teaches calculus at the high school. I know that Pam teaches at the high school. So we have a very broad range of teachers working on this just so we have teachers who know at all different levels that there is a flow. I think that's really an, an important that, that transition is I find it's really important between when you're coming from elementary to middle and on to high school. So I appreciate your paying attention to it, guys, and look forward to all the success. Thanks a lot. Mr. DeGorio. How long you? Is this on now? <laughs> How long have you guys been looking at this entire program and process, the whole process? How long have you been involved in this, would you say? You guys looking at each other like, hmm, yeah. How long? Quite a while, I would imagine, right? Well, it came in some different phases. I was brought into it um, several months ago, as I think some people were, and then as the team developed, it kind of gelled. So I think hard work, we've, I've been working a couple months, I would say, on this, like hard, like okay. meeting several times and really pushing our sleeves up and digging into it. You guys but it kind of developed throughout the year. You guys all look kind of, well, you look younger than me, but that's not going much. <laughs> but you all look like you're pretty experienced as educators. Is that a fair assessment? So if you take all your experience and combine it, we're looking at a lot of years. And you guys feel this is the way to go and that this is going to be successful. 
recognizing the fluidity of education, we have to understand that not everything is successful. We can try it, and if it doesn't work, we try something else. And that's what you guys are doing. You have my complete admiration, you have 100% of my support. I think that you guys have put together a fantastic plan. You look like you guys are ready to move on it, and it looks like it has a cohesiveness to it. So I say have at it, and let's go get them. Thank you. Any other questions? I actually, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you very much to all of you for putting in all the extra time and the work for all our children that, um, that will, uh, De deserves all this and they'll, they'll raise to the top, so to speak, as the program there is. And I just want to give you guys a big kudos. And I just want to recognize Tammy Perrault, who is our director of mathematics, who's kind of working with this team. I know she doesn't, she's not speaking tonight because the, really the forefront of this is our teachers. Uh, but, but it takes good leaders to work with, with teachers and pull the right people together and get them, uh, give them the resources they need to be successful. So Tammy, thank you very much. And Jeff, thank you very much. Director of Curriculum Instruction Assessments. Any other questions? If not, just a quick comment from the chair. Uh, I think the discussion over the evolution of curriculum in Southbridge is heading in the right direction. I think we've got the brightest minds in the think tank that our math team is a team. Under the leadership of Ms. Perot, we can coordinate, communicate. I think being in front of us tonight, letting us know where we're headed, and I think presenting it to the public on where we're going, uh, we will be waiting uh, on different intervals of this road to support, uh, whether it be text, technology. I know you're all excited about the, a lot of things going on in the school system, and I really uh, pay tribute to each and every teacher that has to teach in Massachusetts that we've evolved so quickly, no sooner than you got something down pat, they changed it again on us. So I think uh, you, you've done an admirable, admirable job, but I think uh, there, there's a big job ahead. And I think uh, Mr. O'Leary touched on it, but I have the confidence that we have the excellence and the brightest minds working on it. So uh, I'd like to thank the superintendent also for bringing this presentation forward and the curriculum coordinator. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our uh, um, uh, English language arts team. Uh, some of those representatives are here this evening to talk to you about where we are in the same process with English language arts. Uh, Karen Ryan, who's our director of literacy, is uh, teaching tonight, so she's unable to be here at the college level. Uh, but I know the team members are here and have a presentation uh, similar to the one you just saw. But it's a little different because ELA is in a different place than math is right now. And I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, good evening. Um, we do have a different presentation in a different color. Um, <laughs> I am Kathleen Cataret here to represent Charlton Street School, and with me this evening, I have just a few members from the ELA team. We are a much larger group, but this evening with me, I have Violet Quinn representing Eastwood Road School, Miriam Krantz from Wells Middle School, and Courtney Curry, the sixth through 12 department chair. Um, I just want to clarify, piggybacking off of a few statements made by the members um, on the committee, that we as teachers, it's our, we are expected to teach the standards. And there's a difference between curriculum and program. So we're talking tonight about the standards that are set forth by the state mm -hmm. and what is our responsibility to teach to the students. So um, in discussing our goals, that is what we're, our focus is and what we're keeping in mind is that we're trying to align ourselves with what is mandated to be taught to our students with our uh, focus being on the standards. So our goals, of course, are to best implement the Common Core. And um, I'm a hands-on type of person, so I brought with me my grade two curriculum. And that is one of our jobs as a team, is to take all of this information unpack it, unroll it, and put it into a format which is digestible for our classroom teachers to, so that they can best put their efforts into planning lessons and units for our students. So we are trying to create a unified list of resources to help us to teach those, those standards. And as the other team already talked about, we are using the, in, um, the ANET Achievement Network interim assessments to help guide us in our instruction. 
what we are also doing as a team is trying to create that same scope and sequence of standards that support the Common Core and the shifts that the Common Core introduced to us. We're all familiar with what we know as the state frameworks, and it's sort of the same thing. The Common Core just has a few changes, and that's what they call shifts. And those changes are basically asking students and teachers to to use more rigor with our, with our students, to use higher order thinking skills and have our children become masters at closed reading of text, to find evidence in text and report back. And to, our goal is to help our teachers to learn the best ways. Um, my slide here says new ways, but I feel like it's not new, it's the best practices that have been used in the past and we need to be using in the future. New types of readings and ways to think about literacy. Again, the Common Core talks about shifts, which are really just kind of changes in focus. The old standards were much broader, um, much more detailed, and these are broader statements. For example, an ELA shift would be um, knowing, based upon research, that by fourth grade, most people, most 50 percent of what people read as adults, over 40% by fourth grade should be informational. So we need to continue to enhance the literary and the fiction that our young students are, are always exposed to, but know that by the time they're in eighth grade, we're reading for meaning, we're reading for information, and that's just life. So what the shifts will look like in the classroom are that our texts are helping to push for that independent level of reading that our students are reading more complex texts at their level, and that the teachers are scaffolding instruction to best meet the needs of our students. That includes writing um, under valid textual evidence to support the students learning from the text. So everything is connected. And Courtney's gonna take over. So what the team is doing um, as a group, there are some things that we are doing and some things that we aren't. Um, what we are doing is we're giving people the standards that need to be taught in a six to eight week um, cycle, but we're not telling people what day they have to teach what standard or what week they have to be doing this. Um, so there's some flexibility and there's some um, opportunities for differentiation in the classroom. And then we're also giving people a list of resources to use for each cycle and to address each standard, but we're not telling everybody how to approach teaching a standard so that creativity can stay within the classroom based on a teacher's preferences, preferences or student needs. Um, and in order to make this happen, we're creating a scope and sequence. Um, and we are also using, similar to the math, the same SAS um, cycle for assessments between six to eight weeks. And um, like Kathleen said, we're really pushing more um, inclusion of non-fictional and informational text in our instruction. Um, we're also going to be using data to drive our instruction, so we'll be looking at the assessments and the results and seeing where our students um, have weaknesses and readdressing and reteaching those weaknesses so that we make sure that they reach proficiency in those areas. And then finally, our big goal is to increase rigor. And um, that includes increasing text complexity, um, requiring students to think on higher levels of critical thinking, and just really pushing our students towards that level of excellence and proficiency that we know that they can reach. Any questions? Any questions by school committee? I'd like to, I'd like to say a couple of things. First of all, thank you very much, Courtney, everybody here, Kathleen. Uh, it's extremely, this is not easy work, as I said. It's, not, it's, just as, it's just as not easy for ELA as it is. Is that a good word? Is that good language? It's, as it is for math. It's very difficult to do what we're, what we're trying to get our teachers to do, and, and they're <clears throat> admirably doing a great job of doing it. It goes back to something that's in our strategic plan and something that I talked to you about over a year ago, which is that we need to teach our kids up here. We need to stop with the idea that Southbridge kids can't meet the need the standards that are set by the, the national uh, norms around the country for what every fourth grader can learn or fifth grader can learn. We need to teach our kids where we expect them to be. And when they talk about scaffolding up, they talk about what that means is it means providing the support that kids need to get there. That's what we have to do and that's what the new Common Core standards and what the work these folks are doing will allow us to do that 
and increase the rigor and thereby increase the achievement level of our students and that's why, that's why we exist as a school system. So ladies, thank just, you very just, much. Just a thank quick, quick comment. Um, I'd just like to comment. Uh, one of the words that you came out with on this team was uh, identifying the weakness. Um, when you're teaching and kids are learning, everybody learns at a different pace. I was impressed with the comment of it's kind of a tracking thing, locating what, where we're weak, identifying it, and solving the problem. That seems to be one of the things from the past that haunted us. Uh, we did well in certain areas, then we didn't do well in other areas, and I think that uh, I'm very optimistic under the, comp, uh, the uh, comments here that we're going to be identifying, tracking, and conquering the problem. At least they're identifying it before they attack it. I think that's very good. Thank you very much again. Eric. Thank you. Ladies. Thank you. Mr. Zangi? I think he's just the technology guru tonight. Uh, we're actually going to gonna turn this over to, I think, uh, Mr. Meyer and his team uh, for a presentation, an update on where we are with special education and the integrated service model. He'll introduce his team members. Mr. Zangi's not going to make a speech. No. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to be doing a brief update of uh, the special education in the district. Uh, and, uh, part of my, of my presentation is about uh, the integrated service delivery model, and we brought a couple of uh, people here to speak about that from, uh, who's going first? Okay. From Charlton Street School, Karen Basco and Sarah Sturgis. Bosco. I uh, teach second grade at Charlton Street School. I'm a regular edu education classroom teacher. And I'm Sarah Sturgis. I'm the inclusion teacher in this, the classroom. Oh. Perfect. Okay. Um, so what we're, we're here tonight just to um, share the positive experiences that we've had uh, this year as a full inclusion model um, and what we have learned implementing uh, this model. That's what we're going to share with you. Um, our room is made up of 19 students. Um, there's a regular education teacher, a special education teacher, and a full-time paraprofessional in our room at all times. And we also have support staff that works within our classroom. Um, and I'll get a little bit further that, into that in just a minute. All right, and to start off, we're gonna talk about our classroom setup. Our classroom is center-based. It's not set up like a traditional classroom with desks lined up in a row. We have centers set up around the room. Um, and each center is student focused. We also have no teacher desks within the room. We know that's a little bit different. We started off the year like that. Um, originally we did that because we wanted it to be more student oriented, kid friendly. We didn't want too much teacher material in the room. But we found as the year went on, we actually were more um, productive as teachers. We were more engaged with the students and um, we, were, we, were, we were better able to monitor them within the room. Um, it's hard to determine who the classroom teacher is also. Um, as mentioned before, with um, support staff, um, the support staff that we do receive in the room, they do not pull the students out. Um, they service their students uh, who need those services within the classroom. Um, it, it's important for us to sit down on a weekly basis or even more often for our common planning time with those teachers um, just to get together so that we're all teaching efficiently. Um, we're teaching with the same objectives and overall the same goals uh, to be covered. And with proper planning, it's just another easy way to keep it uh, full inclusion. Um, students are uh, hard to distinguish front of the room. Um, because we work in small groups on a very, very regular basis um, and we're in centers, our room is uh, in, it, like I said, in center so often. We don't really have a front and central part of the room. Um, we use it uh, as a whole group time for about 10 minutes for uh, initial instruction when we're covering something for the first time, and then we break into those small groups to further explicitly teach um, what, we're, what we're to be covering from the standards. And this is just a picture of our room, just to give you a visual. As you can see, we have no teacher desk, no front of the room, and we're broken up into small groups. All right, and to talk about our center-based instruction, um, when we do our centers, we have four different leveled groups, and these groups are based on needs. 
Um, <coughs> they're flexible and interchangeable. So we, we base our centers on assessments, whether it's pre-assessment or um, observation or any other kind of informal assessment. And then during our centers, we have three groups working um, in intense small group setting. While one group is working independently, they're doing either something on the computer or they're working on versatiles or we have a great um, tech program called LeapFrog. So that's another independent um, activity that they do. Um, each center has its own objectives. Um, however, each center focuses on the same skill throughout the classroom. Um, it's important for us to post the objectives every time we teach a lesson just so that the students know what's expected of them and also so they know we have a purpose up there um, and we, you know, our, our expectations of them need to be met. So, um, like I said, our objectives are very important in our classroom in each, each group. Um, also, group rotation chart, um, you want to get to that? It's a, we have a sample of one up here with the, the coins. It's a color coordinated, very easy visual for our second graders just because because we have um, the flexible flexibility of moving students from one group to another, depending on their ability at that time with what we're covering, um, we want to make it clear and easy for them. At the beginning of the year, this was you know, the first year we're doing this. Beginning of the year, we did have a couple of hiccups here and there with rotation, and even a little bit in the middle of the year. So we found the best way to do so was, was, was with such a clear visual. Um, we have coins up here just because we were covering um, money at last uh, everyday math unit. and. Um, so we had penny, penny centers and dime centers, and, and they would rotate accordingly. So the dimes would come to me, pennies to Ms. Sturgis, and so on. Just kind of a cute way to keep them entertained, too. Um, groupy, groupings, or excuse me, color-coordinated bins provided for each student also, which is that other picture you're looking at there. Just um, for independent work, if a student uh, doesn't have time to finish or whatnot, they go into those bins, and they know what's expected of them when they when and if they do have free time, um, there's always work for them to be um, completing and continuing on with. All right, and this is just an example of a math block. Um, we start off with a five to seven minute introduction of the skill. That's when we talk about the objective and we introduce to the students what we're gonna do within each center. Then we break up into our centers and then we do a three to five minute wrap up on the rug and we just review the, the objectives and we talk about what they learned with, within their centers. So here we have some photos of our centers. Take the focus off of us. <laughs> um, so we have explicit instruction going on here. Um, and also uh, the bottom right picture is uh, students who are independently working. Uh, I think that's with Versatiles at that time. Um, so they, they're, you know, they understand what to do, what's expected of them, and we try to set the highest expectations possible even when they're working by themselves. And this is just a picture of how we integrate technology within our classroom. Um, we have an Eno board. We're lucky enough to have one of those, and we utilize it quite a bit. We use it on a daily basis, um, and we also use the computers in the room quite a bit. And this is a picture of our data wall. Um, our classroom is extremely data-driven. That's what we base all of our centers off of, so we just wanted to kind of show off our data wall. We put a lot of hard work into that. <laughs> Um, just a, a wrap up, um, the important attributes that we feel are key to our successful full inclusion classroom this year in second grade was uh, flexibility, and that's flexibility among, um, you know, students coming in and out as needed uh, into our groups, and also flexibility among all of us as teachers, the teachers who come in, service, and, and leave. We, need, we all need to be um, able to change as needed and, and shift and, and so on. High expectations for all students, obviously. Um, positive reinforcement, you know, catch them being good, praise them, so that classroom behavior isn't, isn't a part of, you know, any kind of negative situation. We keep it positive in our room and we have um, ways of doing that. Um, sharing tools, and that means, obviously, materials, ideas, constructive criticism, and the responsibility of the outcomes of the assessments. And, you know, not one teacher is doing it above another teacher, or one teacher, you know, isn't doing it as well. We, our common planning time is the most important time where we can converse and figure out what worked, what didn't, and what we can do to better that. Um, and of course, like I just said, preparation time and planning time is, is also key. Is that it? That's it? Oh. I believe so. Yep, questions? Comments? Any questions? 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, ladies, for coming and sharing that information. Um, I do have a couple of questions because when this program was brought to us way at the beginning of the year, um, it was described to us of having four different levels of classroom teaching um, for the needs of the students. So I was wondering exactly what level of classroom teaching, A, B, C, or D, that your students are in and also that this is just one classroom out of many and not every classroom I don't believe is set up the way you are so I just you know I want to for the parents that are seeing this on TV mm -hmm. you know they're going to maybe have a student that's in a classroom they're like oh ours don't doesn't run that way so just if you could explain a little bit more about what level you're at for teaching and some of the other differences perhaps um, if you could before you answer that question, let me try to explain a little bit more about the ABCD. Uh, when, when we decided to do the inclusion, uh, the full inclusion, the integrated service model, we knew that our resources were limited. So we decided to concentrate students who had similar disabilities uh, in classrooms where the services could be provided in one classroom versus spread out among several classrooms. So in doing that, that means the kids who have the highest need have more staff members because that's where the services need to be. So in this classroom, there are three, so I'm guessing you're probably a B classroom? We're an A. Actually. You're an A. Yes. Okay, so you're the top level. We're actually the bottom level. The, the lowest level. Yes. Okay. So go ahead. Talk about that, how, how yeah. that functions in your classroom. Because I've been in this classroom, just so you know, uh, a couple of times, and, and it's, I would say it's a model classroom oh, yeah, for, for, the, for, the, for, for what yeah. we want this to go to. Uh, and these ladies are, are, it's a testament to their work together that they're able to, when I walk in there, I don't know what student is special ed, what student is ELL, what student, what, I don't know which teacher is the regular teacher versus the, the, the specialist. I don't know the answer to that and that's the way it should be. Uh, because that means they all are responsible for every child in that classroom. So I know I keep talking, but you guys go ahead. I, yeah. You're clarifying everything for us. Thank you. We're done. No. Um, as, as you were, I admire what you do. <laughs> as you were just saying, um, we, we are um, the gritty classroom, and we do have uh, help in our classroom quite a bit, which is tremendous um, with the diversity that we do have in our classroom. So um, we do, like I like said in the slide, there are three of us um, full time, which is fantastic. And we are able to, to create these centers and these groupings so that um, we are trying to get these students at their, you know, their zones of proximal de the development there, you know, so that they need that push to get to the next level. Um, and we have to, and we base that, um, I'm going to take one, I don't know, base that according to what teacher is teaching what at what time. Um, we do rotate the centers too, so it's not one group of students receiving services from Mrs. Sturgis alone. Mm -hmm. It'll come to me after and so on and so forth. Right. So. That was definitely a challenge for us in the beginning of the year, um, integrating all the kids together at once because they are, they are very diverse within that classroom. Um, but it took us a while, but throughout the year, these centers really made it work. Um, and it's great because within our centers, we don't just have my students and then her students in the center. We actually have them integrated amongst each other, so we have great models. And my students do start picking up on what her students do. and. It really, it does work. We saw it at the end of the year, and it's, it's great. It, you just busted us my students yesterday. What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> and another positive, I'd just like to add one thing, is it's wonderful seeing the, the cooperation, the collaboration among the second graders in that classroom. At the beginning of the year, um, maybe they weren't helping each other out as much, but there are clear leadership skills being built. Right. Um, and, and wonderful role models um, being displayed by the end of the year. It's, it's tremendous. It's, so it's, it's fascinating to watch, <laughs> it really is. We're very proud of, of our <laughs> students for that. Yes, um, yes I just, I, you know, I wanna say thank you. I thought the presentation was wonderful and the reason why I asked that question is because when it's brought to us in a meeting and they say A, B, C, D, and a lot of us don't know. Um, some of us do know, I know I, I volunteer every Tuesday at Charlton Street School, so I see a lot of the work in different classrooms. I haven't ventured down to see your room, but I mean, it's wonderful that you're working that way. And I kind of like the idea with no teacher desks, you yes. know, so the students, it, you know, it gives you more room in your classroom. Right. But I just want to say that, you know, it, it's great to see the progress that's been made and to know, for the people to know that there's, you know, the different levels and that you're doing a great job and, and the kids are working together. And that's why I asked the question, Very because good. it's hard Thank for you. us to visualize it. 
Any other questions by school committee? If not, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Jan Weinberg and Melissa Zapula from Wells Middle School. Hi, I'm uh, Jonathan Weinberg. I, we teach uh, sixth grade social studies at the Mary E. Wells. And I'm Melissa Zapula. I teach sixth grade special education at Mary E. Wells. While they're working on their uh, getting their PowerPoint up, let me tell I, I've been in this classroom as well a couple of times. and. I know there's a teacher who works in that classroom, an ELL teacher who isn't here this evening. When I walked into this classroom, having been a secondary principal for so long, I was amazed at the, the level of integration in this classroom. Uh, it's, a, it's a testament to how three teachers coming together who are all good teachers can create an environment that's good for all kids at a very, very high level. And it's a testament to the work you're doing because it's a little different in a middle school or high school classroom than it is to a, uh, for an elementary classroom. But you guys go ahead and give your presentation. I just wanted to say that I, I really admire what you're doing. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, our, our guideline at, at the beginning of the year, we were given some uh, work that, uh, to help us sort of guide how we were to do the, get the uh, microphone, co teaching uh, model. Get the microphone on. And uh, the guideline said that all the ed educators, the three of us in the room, would be co teaching. Uh, that we're all responsible for differentiating the instructional plan and the delivery, the assessment of the student achievement, as well as uh, classroom management. Um, our classroom in particular has three different teachers, like Mr. Ely said. Uh, we have the content teacher, Mr. Weinberg, um, myself as a special education teacher, and we have also have the English language learner teacher as well, um, who we all share in the planning and the delivering of each and every lesson, planning the objectives, and the um, and delivering each piece of the lesson to each other or to the, our students. Uh, as far as the approaches that were used throughout the year, um, again, we. we try to take different approaches as we went through. Uh, one was supportive co-teaching, uh, where one of us would take the lead role, um, and the other members would rotate am amongst the student population uh, to provide support to, to talk about uh, what's going on uh, throughout the, the lesson. Um, examples of this have included, um, before each of us planning a different PowerPoint while the other teachers move through the classroom, making sure students are following along, make sure they're understanding, as well as clarifying points. Um, one thing that I feel that um, Mr. Weinberg and I do very well is that if we, we supplement each other in terms of teaching. And so if there's something that I may have missed or he and me have missed, we make sure that we make, touch upon it. So we very well complement each other in making sure that we're getting the objectives across and while keeping the rigor. And uh, our example is in our classroom, but uh, it was a classroom that we located that they were uh, doing some of the approaches that we were using in our uh, room. Um, another approach that we used was parallel co-teaching, uh, where members of the team instruct different heterogeneous groups of students uh, simultaneously. This can be done within the classroom, uh, where we break off into, into separate groups. Um, this can be done if we need to, to break them off into different rooms and then bring them back together, uh, however is needed. One example that we uh, did of parallel co-teaching throughout the school year is that we had, since we have three certified teachers in our classroom, we were able to separate the students into heterogeneous groups based on whether or not they are an English language learner or they were um, a student that requires specialized instruction. And we were able to break them apart into separate groups and rotate them throughout the week. Um, so one day I would teach one topic um, Mr. Weinberg was teaching another topic, and another, and the English language learner um, teacher was teaching another topic, and then we would rotate the groups per day. We've also done the other um, type of parallel co-teaching that Mr. Ely had possibly seen was where we were in the same classroom. We split our kids up into different, um, into different heterogeneous groups. We worked on different topics, and then they presented it to each other. So they were getting that teaching, and they were able to. Um, explain to the other students what they learned. 
Yeah, that's, that's the one that I saw, and I want to interject just a second. That classroom was extremely powerful because students were teaching students. You couldn't tell what student had what disability or language barrier, and what I was really impressed with was the three teachers in the room, if I didn't know each one of them, I wouldn't know who was the social studies teacher, who was the ELL teacher, and who was the special education teacher. They, they, they played off of each other almost like Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis used to, you know? It's just, they, one would start a sentence and another would finish it. It was just, it was really amazing and powerful, I think, as a, as a tool, and, and you to be commended for that. And again, this quote, we, we heard flexibility and fluidity, so that, you know, we thought this quote would be, a, again, it's a appropriate. That we have to be fluid as we, as we go through and, and each day see what, what's gonna uh, be brought upon us. Um, and then another uh, approach that we, we try to use with the uh, complementary co-teaching model, where a member of the co-teaching team does something to supplement or complement the instruction uh, provided by other members of the team. Um, examples that we have done of this are making sure that we have overhead projectors. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Weinberg's classroom isn't uh, equipped with a smart board, but we do make sure that we have visuals constantly available for our students as we do have such a diverse need of the learners. Um, modeling the note taking, we have very much, especially because Mr. Weinberg and our ELL teacher have been very involved in the Keys to Literacy training, um, very much modeling the note taking, making sure that the, the students are following along and again, uh, paraphrasing the statements, making it clear because in Again, we have such a diverse group of learners. One of our classrooms has, I believe, like, uh, 16 students, and the other one has about 25 students. And so it becomes very challenging to make sure that ev all the students are understanding everything the first time it's given. And that, for me personally, as a special education teacher, re repeat, repeat, repeat. So the more we can paraphrase it, and the fact that we have three different people to say it three different ways, as well as the 25 students to repeat it as well. Um, we make sure that we get all the learning and their, all the information and for each of those students. Uh, and again, uh, you know, the Keys to Literacy program, I think we, we did some summary writing, which I think is something that, uh, and Ms. Ely, that when you came in, you saw them do some summary writing and then they were teaching out and doing some group work like that. Um, so. Again, that's some of the approaches and some of the ways that we've been trying to uh, use the co-teaching model at uh, Wells Middle School. Are there any questions by the school committee? If there are no questions, I thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to ask a question. We had the presentations, and I know that when we went into occlusion and various things with the curriculum, do we have a tracking mechanism that uh, tracks the inclusion success or non-success? Well, we have we, all of our students are in inclusive settings, so we have we have we will have obviously MCAS data. We also have uh, assessment data ongoing with all of our students, so we can compare anything really. We compare previous uh, previous. Uh, achievement versus new achievement we can do all those things and now we have with our data manager has a database of those of that, of that information so good. we will be tracking that that's one of the things our data teams do on a regular basis good I think mr. Meyer has the rest of this presentation Logically disabled, <laughs> impaired, I guess is the right word. Uh, uh, thank you very much for those presentations. That was um, uh, some real good examples of some of the real positive things that are happening because of this model in, in the district. Um, I want to touch on uh, um, briefly um, uh, five areas, and I'm going to just do another minute on the integrated service delivery model, but talk about some collaborative and out of district placements. Our current district programs, some new district programs, and some things that we're doing, some exciting things that we're doing for prevention and intervention. Uh, 
This integrated service delivery model, you know, it's based on a lot of research um, that kids that are included are do better than kids that are, that are substantially separate as a rule, that we can do services uh, push in and pull aside rather than removing them so that they don't miss critical instruction that's happening for every student. Uh, this is part of the Massachusetts tiered support system. Uh, and this is something that the state is pushing, um, and uh, I think we're way ahead of the curve in this. And everything, and you've heard this uh, from the presenters talk about differentiated instruction, that we want to present a concept to the whole class and then bring it down to a level and a skill level and for instruction uh, uh, where we can get kids from where they are to where we want them to be. Um, so in, in cases, there will be some kids that are pulled out. Um, and sometimes those kids in this classroom, they are doing some independent and unrelated things, and that's okay. Uh, sometimes, and most of the time, at least, there's parallel instruction where they're working on the same skills or same activities. And what you've really seen today is the model that we're really, everything's meshing together and the teachers are working as a team and, uh, and, and functioning really well. That, and that's the ideal goal for every student. But it does take a while to get there. But they're doing an outstanding job here and in the other buildings in the district. Um, this has been a collaborative effort with uh, um, ELL, Title I, Special Education, General Education. It's not just special ed out there or ELL, or it's like a shared ownership of kids. And we meet all the time in our, in our uh, cabinet meetings and our um, uh, district meetings and talking about uh, instruction and curriculum, doing learning walks and what works, what doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> What you saw is a real good example of what we're really trying to press. Uh, another area that uh, when I was hired four years ago was, to, was talking about uh, our out-of-district placements. Um, a status right now as of what I, what I looked at today is that we have currently five students in a residential placement. We have one student in a hospital placement. We have 13 students in private day placements. And we have 35 students in our collaborative placements. Um, in 2008 and 9, we had 68 students involved in these um, uh, out-of-district programs. As of today, we have 56. And we do provide a continuum of services from the general education classroom to our district programs, collaborative programs, private, and everyone is more restricted until we get the residential. Our goal is we want to keep the kids here. And we want to build our capacity provide these services and prevent these out of district services, we'd rather spend our money here on our kids and we can do, and we can do a better job. Um, programs that we've, that we've uh, established, we had one middle school, high school program when I took over and four years ago, we've expanded that to two programs. Um, we had uh, two pass programs for kids with autism. Uh, we've expanded that to three. We've also added a life skills program Uh, this year, uh, for, for next year, we're looking to do a work experience program, bringing students back from the collaborative. This is for our older kids, 17, 18 years old through age 21. Also, some younger students that are away um, and out of the district because they've created a lot of excitement and they are, um, they don't do well in a seven period that any more of a hands-on curriculum. So we want to, we want to create some excitement. Now that we have some space in the old high school, we think we can provide a good program for them there. Our capacity right now is that we have approximately 15 students in our past classrooms. 24 students were served this year in our SOAR programs. Six in our life skills program. Our work experience programs, we're looking at about 10 kids, 55 kids. Uh, if these students were in our collaboratives at 35 to 45 to 50 thousand dollars a piece, it would cost us a lot of money. So we are saving, besides, besides saving money, we're providing them with a better program. Um, some of the exciting things we're doing in special ed and um, you know, through uh, Eric's uh, leadership with our accelerated improvement plan, uh, we are, uh, I've been working, uh, I was working with our ELL coordinator and uh, uh, we have a high number of students that are both English language learners and, and special education. We're trying to reduce that number and looking at ways to do that. We're looking at uh, uh, expanding our response to intervention uh, for next year. We've had some people in to do some, some training with us overall and our special ed people are going to be involved with that. 
as well as uh, um, uh, other, other district staff. Uh, the, stu the school support teams and the data collection. And I mentioned Dibbles here because that's what I know and it's, it's uh, something that all students are uh, given benchmarks in grades K through five. Uh, so we can compare and see how our, our students with disabilities are comparing with general education students. And we're using it then for progress monitoring, it's making sure that they're trying to close that gap. Uh, another initiative that we're looking at for next year and doing some training on starting this summer is uh, positive behavior supports. Any questions about the school committee to direct them? Thank you, Mr. Pat, Just a quick question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you give us a little bit more information positively on um, the program that's going to be going into the high school? Is it going to be one program, two programs? How many students? You know, the, the ins and outs, because a lot of people are asking questions and they're saying, oh, you know, older kids are going to be in our neighborhood. I don't know. You know, so if it, you know if it's going to start in September, like everyone else, I think it, you know we should have if we have information yeah. on that. If it's not going to start in September, maybe mid-year. Um, whatever you can give us on that. Yeah, uh, these students that we're talking about, uh, there's an older the, an older group of students that are uh, right now their ages 18 through 21. Um, they are uh, in a wonderful program that our collaborative is running, where they actually do some uh, life skills instruction during in, uh, at, at their campus. And then they go out with the support into the community to either some volunteer work, just some community experiences, some, some uh, group projects, even some paid, some paid work uh, with job coaches. And we're trying to duplicate that program so that and we're, we're, we're leasing uh, some vans for transportation to get them into the community, provide some support with them to teach them how to do a job, work on their social skills, their coping skills, their life skills for um, uh, so that they can become as independent as possible bef uh, uh, when they turn 22. As part of our transition planning, we want to teach them self-advocacy, uh, which is really important and one of the state mandates for kids that are age um, uh, 14 and older, actually. So uh, this is uh, going to be a, pretty much a community-based program. We'll spend some time on campus, um, uh, and you know we'll have uh, uh, you know access to computers and they'll be doing some life skills activities uh, hopefully we'll be doing some projects around the, the, the building um, then also maybe get out and do some stuff in the hos uh, hospital uh, right now the students we're bringing back are doing uh, wheels on meals we have somebody working at a McDonald's we have people doing uh, some recycling so there's a lot of a lot of opportunity in the community uh, to uh, get these kids involved and get them to know the community Second program, Mike. Second program is for younger kids. We're going to be spending time working on their uh, MCAS uh, skills that they're going to need for ELA, math, and science. But then more of a hands-on curriculum from pre-vocational things to get them ready so um, we can get them also out into the world of work when, 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 they, when they get done with the MCAS. And these are currently all Southbridge students. All Southbridge students. That we're paying a substantial amount of money to the collaborative. So these two programs will house about 10 kids right yes. to start. And save us about one hundred fifty thousand dollars next year. We we figured uh, at least um, you know one hundred to two hundred thousand um, dollars for the tuitions, um, and we're we've offered the uh, I've offered the program to other special ed directors at a substantial discount to them. We're hoping that they will respond. And any other questions? You know, I just want to. This is going to. So this will start in the regular school year in September after the holidays. We we actually yes. have some kids starting this summer. This yeah. summer they're yeah. starting already. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions by school committee? I'd just like to thank you very much for your presentation tonight. Nice job. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And I'd like to thank all the teachers who are still here. Yeah. Uh, and thank the three principals who are here this evening, Diane Shaw, John Riley, and, and Brian Montigny for coming up and supporting the teachers. We appreciate it. Uh, uh, and, our, uh, and our curriculum uh, director, uh, Jeff Zangi, and, and Tammy Peralt, our math director and Caroline, who's not here this evening. So it's a lot of people working very hard in this district. A lot of good things happen tonight. I think you saw tonight the quality of the teaching staff in this district and the things we're capable of doing when we put our mind to it. And I think we now have a focus. We have a direction. And uh, I think uh, we understand that the rigor is needed. And I, we have teachers here who are willing to take on that challenge. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to move on to agenda item number nine, the report of the superintendent. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me tell you how much I enjoyed graduation. Uh, graduation of the senior class went very, very well. 
Uh, we had a beautiful day in the middle of all the rain. Uh, just worked out very, very well, and, and our graduates are to be commended. The high school staff and, and administrative staff are to be commended for putting on a very good show. The band was wonderful. I, I just thought it was a, a great uh, event. Uh, I followed that up with uh, this past uh, Friday night, a teacher retirement dinner out at uh, uh, Cohasse, where we have, uh, we have nine teachers who are retiring, as we know right now. Only four were able to make it because the rest are out uh, doing things uh, for future uh, careers and those, those kind of things. So uh, we had four teacher retirements, and we'll recognize all of those teachers at a future meeting to, so we know uh, all their names and, and put them on the agenda so everybody can see that. But uh, it was a really nice event, and, and Diana I know was there as well, and, and the union invited me to speak, and uh, Mr. Joe Van was also there to, to speak, and, and we really appreciate all the work that those teachers have put in in this district. Uh, I think nine teachers was over 240 years of service, uh, so it's, it's really a testament to their uh, longevity as well as their dedication to the Southbridge schools. I had the uh, opportunity last week to, uh, to sit in Mrs. Sabordi's class. Mrs. Sabordi's on our math team, and uh, I actually did the reach out and read in her class to, to first graders. And uh, I lost my book, uh, but they wouldn't let me get away with not going, so I had to get another book. I read Duck for President. I think that's going to get my vote. I'm going to do a write-in. Uh, so I, uh, I, I enjoyed reading to those kids, and they were, they were really, really, really a great group of first graders and, and uh, asked some really good questions, too. Plus, they figured out how old I was, so they know now what year I was born and all that stuff. So we, we, added, we added math to the, to the lesson. Uh, but, uh, you know, just the things that are happening in this district are good, are positive. I was up at the new middle high school today, and I know there will be a report on that later, but, but uh, to see the progress in that building, I would encourage people. I think this coming Saturday is, is the next Saturday is the last formal uh, 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 walk around, visit, uh, and then we'll have other visits throughout the summer and at the, in the fall. But that building is really getting close, uh, and it is absolutely a wonderful building, and, and uh, the construction folks are, they're, they're hitting it pretty hard right now to, to finish on time, and, and we have furniture moving in there on the 19th, so uh, there's a lot of work being done, and I have other things to report on later, but, but uh, a lot of positive things are happening, and, and uh, those are all good things, and I think people need to start talking about those things. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item number 10, the report of the business manager, fiscal report, fiscal report of financial year 2012. Mr. I'm, Wiggins. Uh, I'm passing down the, uh, the last projected financial report. The next one you'll get will be the year-end financial report. Um, and I would commend you to the last page, where the grand total, if you will, we're projecting a fund balance of $173,705.99. Now out of that, there are uh, three soft costs, if you will, um, that if you remember, we've been having a budget freeze all year because we anticipated some soft costs that would come due with the building project that would not be MSBA eligible. Um, and so I'm holding some money for those to be spent prior to June 30th. That would leave a projected fund balance of 8470599 and my recommendation would be that if we end up with a fund balance in that vicinity, that we take that balance and we use it to prepay tuitions. Mr. Wigan, there will be a, a, an agenda item, a, an action item for the school committee at the next meeting to prepay tuition? Yes. I don't, I don't like to do that until the last gap. I understand. Yep. We, we, we have the invoices in hand. I mean, we're ready to write the, the, the checks, if you will, but um, until we absolutely know what that bottom line is going to be. We're fairly confident in this number because we literally went through every single employee and projected out, obviously, what we would owe them for the rest of the year, went through all of the different lines, obviously all the purchase orders that are encumbered, anything we could unencumber. So. This is, I would say, a fairly close approximation to where the year end will be. Moving on to agenda item number 11, school committee actions. A move that the Southwest School Committee approve the changes in the central office staff base salaries and titles as proposed by the school business manager. Is there a motion? So moved. We have a second. There's a motion and a second discussion. Uh, the chairman asked me to request the committee to postpone it to a specific date so he could be here for this. 
Uh, I leave it up to the committee. If uh, you'd like to postpone a uh, motion and second at this time would be in, in, in favor. If not, we move forward on it. Motion, motion to postpone. Motion to postpone by Tom O'Leary. Uh, is there a second? Second. There's a second. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Discussion? Uh, you have to add, give it to a specific date. That's what I'm just asking. The next meeting uh, is what uh, he requested. Yeah, I, I, just, I appreciate it. Um, I think the What's chairman the deserves meeting? the opportunity to be here and uh, have his voice, so uh, thank you. The second, Mary Ellen. 25th. We're on Monday. It's a Monday. Motions to postpone till the 25th. There's a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? One, one opposed. Motion passes. Moving on to B. Move that the Southbridge School Committee authorize the school business manager to purchase a new van via state contract pricing in an amount not to exceed $32,000. And further, that said van will be financed by a three-year lease to be paid for through food service revolving fund monies. Said lease to come back to the school committee for approval before the purchase agreement and lease agreement can be finalized and signed by the business manager. Do I have a motion? To move. Do I have a second? Second. There's a motion, a second, discussion. I just, uh, there's a memo in your packet that kind of updated you on all three vans. Mm -hmm. I think there was concern, and rightly so, last time that I proposed a food service van that we would potentially be purchasing it out of operating funds. In looking at how our food service balance looks right now, it appears that we're going to end up somewhere in excess of $53,000, which is a substantial increase. I think that I could um, safely um, do a three-year lease through the food service to pay for this van exclusively and then to slightly offset a part of that cost by getting the van this summer to help us with our move, I would charge back, I would basically rent the van to the district um, to offset part of the cost um, so that we could use this part of our, our move this summer. Any questions? Do I get to negotiate that rental over the summer with him? Absolutely. All those in favor? Opposed? Unanimous fall present. Moving on to unfinished business, a district reconfiguration update progress. The uh, letters went out um, this week to the parents of elementary students for their assignment for next year. And uh, we had, uh, we, we made an, uh, an error, uh, my fault. Uh, we actually put out, when, in the letter we put a spreadsheet that had the people who live on that street with the parent name, the address, and the student name. We, we should not have published the student name. Uh, with the address, and I apologize for that. I have had a couple of calls from parents. We haven't had a lot, uh, but but it was a mistake, uh, and I'll own up to that. Uh, and we certainly won't make the mistake again. But we we got the letters out, and I think most people now know where their students are going to school. Uh, so uh, that that is where we are. We have appointed all of our staff to particular spots in the buildings. Uh, over the next day or two, the last bit of our staff, our special ed, Title I, and ELL staff will be notified where they will be teaching next year. Most of them aren't changing a whole lot, but some will change. So we'll be notifying them in writing over the next day or two. Uh, so, and boxes are being filled up in the buildings uh, for the teachers who are moving. Uh, teachers who are moving from one building, uh, or, but staying in their own building, just moving from one classroom to another. Everybody knows what room they're going to, so uh, I think we're, we're as far along as we can be right now, uh, and we're, uh, we're very happy with the progress, and our principals, I know, are working very hard to answer questions from staff and things, and I met with the teacher's uh, leadership group uh, for about an hour and a half, a week and a half or so ago, just to discuss some issues that had come up, and we, I think we answered all their questions. So, so things are working well, and, I, and uh, you know, as, as things come up, I'll let you know, but. But right now, it's uh, our biggest issue is that mistake we made when I, when I approved the letters to go out. <coughs> Next agenda item, 12B ad hoc committee update on maintenance department. We have no report at this time. Moving on to C, accelerated improvement plan. Uh, we uh, uh, are still working with state, the state to, get, to make sure that our benchmarks are where they want them to be. We, uh, we should get something back from them 
uh, or to them this week, uh, or if not late next week, early next week. Uh, but the accelerated improvement plan has been implemented, uh, and our district improvement plan has been implemented. And at the next meeting, I'll be doing a presentation to show you what we've accomplished since our long-range strategic plan went into, in, into place uh, and what we're still working on. So uh, you'll have, a, at the next meeting, a presentation from me on where we are with our strategic plan and our, and our accelerated improvement plan. We're going to D, change in, changes in the central office staff base salaries and titles. Do I think wanna... we've basically postponed the discussion, but the job descriptions are in your packet, and if anybody has any questions, they can contact me. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item number 13, new business. Is there any new business? I'd just like to, Dave? You, uh, if you indulge me for two minutes, uh, I'll make it really brief. My mom always told me not, you know, to try and uh, leave things worse than I found. I mean, my dad was more succinct and said, try not to screw things up. <laughs> so I'm gonna do this as quickly as I can. Uh, a couple weeks ago, about two and a half weeks ago, uh, during this election that I'm involved in, uh, I began to feel a little anxiety, and I really didn't know why, but uh, it got a little worse, and it got a little worse, and it got a little worse, and I finally realized that the anxiety was based upon the feeling that I had a, a decent shot at winning this election. And uh, there are some candidates that have come forward that I think would be fantastic for the town of Southbridge. And the anxiety that I was feeling was the fact that I may take away a chance that they would have to bring their new and fresh ideas as well as their independence uh, to the forefront of a school district that deserves people like this to represent it. Uh, therefore, after nine years on the school committee, I'm respectfully withdrawing my name for consideration in the upcoming election. And while I understand I remain on the ballot, I urge you all as voters to go over these incredible candidates and make your selection. Thank you. Anything else in the new business? If nothing else under new business, I'd just like to comment. Uh, the graduation uh, for the class of 2012, I'd like to congratulate them. Um, the impressive part was that the graduating class continues to go up as far as numbers. Uh, it wasn't too long ago there was 60 some odd graduates and we're heading up towards the 100 mark. Um, and I, it continues to get better every year, so we're heading in the right direction. I'd just like to comment on the staff, uh, the middle school, high school, put together a cookout in a staff girls softball game at Southbridge High School. Uh, the chairman, Jack Jovan, was the umpire. I went to the game. My daughter plays for the softball uh, team. I'd like to really congratulate the staff. Uh, they did a fantastic job. It was a great outing. Uh, it was a uh, about 30 teachers, 25, 30 teachers, uh, really working with the students and stuff. And it was, uh, it was also a social moment for the kids to really get to know their teachers even better on, on more of a social thing instead of always in front of the classroom. Uh, I'd like to comment that Mr. Pitcher from Wells is a terrible shortstop. I told him <laughs> I would announce that tonight, but I think Mr. Gabry, who's pushing 70 years old, streaked across right field and caught the ball on the run outstanding left field, uh, right fielder, did a great job. Uh, just like to comment that when, when things like that in the school system happen, uh, it makes it all worth serving and it, uh, it, it's nice to see the kids and the teachers engaged like that. Any further uh, business and new business? If not, um, Scott, sorry. Go ahead. So, sorry, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to um, let everyone know that uh, Charlton Street School had career day last week and I attend, I usually attend every year. Um, and they had a wonderful turnout. The students were very attentive, asked a lot of great questions, and I just wanted to let the parents know um, that their students are wonderful over there, as in every building, but um, I always enjoy doing career day and teaching them about uh, my profession. And also, in case anyone's interested and wanna join them, I believe Thursday morning at nine, between nine and 9.30, they'll be having their flag day ceremony also, so if anyone's interested in doing that, um, that's about it. A, the next regular school committee meeting will be held on June 25th, 2012, council chamber. Is there anything else on new business? If not, moving on to agenda item number 14, school committee reports, FY12 curriculum subcommittee. Uh, nothing to report. Uh, 
the last meeting was canceled. I apologize for that, but there will be a next uh, curriculum subcommittee meeting on Tuesday, the 19th, 6 o'clock, in the Hyman Room. And it will be uh, basically uh, on creation. Thank you. Next policy, Ms. Woodruff. Uh, yes, nothing to report and no meetings. Thank you. Budget Facilities Transportation Subcommittee, no report at this time. D, Collective Bargaining Subcommittee, no report at this time. This is the portion where the building chairman gets to speak. I just happen to wear two hats tonight. Um, I would just like to comment that the building committee meeting is tomorrow, Wednesday, 5 o'clock. Um, the building committee meetings uh, are getting shorter. We're coming towards completion, so it's basically about uh, warrants and money and, and, and the completion. I just would like to thank our superintendent, our business manager down the stretch here. It's been a little hectic uh, with the reconfigurations and stuff and the things they have to do for the building committee. Just like to thank them. Um, the next tour is this Saturday. It's on the 16th. It's at 9 o'clock. It's the last public tour. Uh, the last public tour, we had 125 some odd uh, people. A lot of the families came and they wanted to see whether their kids were going to go to the Southbridge schools or whether they were going to go school choice. We successfully, uh, with our project and what's happening in the building, uh, see the numbers uh, moving the other way. But again, it's the last public tour. We can still, as, as the superintendent said, we uh, have the credit union bank that wants to tour the Southbridge Savings Bank. We have smaller groups. The fifth grade? Yep, the fifth grade. We want to uh, tour with uh, the fifth grade. The building is very safe right now. Uh, you don't have, we're near completion. Some of the floors are totally completed. They're doing cleaning. Uh, as they work their way right out the door in the cafeteria will be a little hectic, but uh, I've got to say that the construction pace that they're, they're keeping is, is remarkable. It's a, it's a crown jewel. It's on time. It's on the budget, and we're going to continue in the same manner. But again, if you didn't get your liability sign off at the superintendent's office we'll have them on site moving on to agenda item number 15 executive session we'll have no executive session tonight moving on to agenda item number 16 adjournment do i have a motion to adjourn so second there's a motion to adjourn second by mr digorio all those in favor opposed thank you very much for watching the southbridge school committee's meetings adjourned